Hello, everybody. It's me, Dr. Kaz. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hope all is well. Um, this is just the latter portion of our um, chat session here. So I just kind of wanted to pick up uh, right here with some white blood cells. We'll continue on with the blood, finish that up. All right, we talked about the red blood cells and glutination, and we learned a little bit about compatibility of blood typing. So let's kind of switch gears here, look at the leukocytes, and uh, talk about our white blood cells here. And just like that, I mean, these cells are specifically designed to protect our body, keep us safe. So they're going to protect us from what some of us would call germs, but pathogens. All right, so um, similar uh, to that process of immunology and immunologic reactions towards things. You have to understand a couple things about these cells. They need to be uh, very much like our red blood cells and be flexible because they got to fit into some nice tight spots. All right. So we'll talk about what I mean by that here shortly. Uh, also, they need to be mobile. They need to move around. All right. What we're going to see is that these cells, all right, are going to be found mostly, this is always an interesting fact, and some people uh, usually think that most of our white blood cells are in the blood, but they're not. They reside in our tissues, okay? And when we say tissues, we're talking about bone marrow and our lymphatic tissues and just general connective tissue all together. So they are mobile and they are flexible. So that brings us to these two terms here that you see in bold, diapedesis and chemotaxis. All right, diapedesis is, all right, when these cells have to squeeze through, all right, the cells that make up the blood vessel wall. All right, so they got to kind of, you know, maneuver themselves in between these cells to make sure if they're tra traveling from the circulatory system into our tissues, so they can get into the tissues and actually all right, uh, uh, go after any pathogens, or if there's damaged tissue, they need to get in there and help to repair that tissue. All right, with the chemotaxis here, all right, this is, you know, you, a lot of us probably don't even think about it, but, you know, you ever wonder, like, how do these white blood cells know where to go? How do they, how are they informed? Well, they have this process of chemotaxis in which it attracts these white blood cells to the infection site with the use of chemicals. Hence the term chemo, all right? So we're using these chemicals that our cells will be releasing in the area of the infection to attract the white blood cells, uh, to wave in the white blood cells. Hey, there's a problem here. There's an infection going on. So, you know, we need you here in this spot. So we're gonna talk about some of the classifications and the classes of our leukocytes. So we break down the leukocytes into two classes granulocytes and agranulocytes. So if you're a granulocyte, and if you look here at the picture, you can see on the light microscope, you'll see these small dots, these particle specks inside the cells. So if you're able to see those uh, with the use of a light microscope, right, we classify that those cells into granulocytes. And then obviously, if you can't see the um, specks or the granules on a light microscope, then they fit into the agranulocyte um, classification there. So the three granulocytes are anyone that ends with the name fill or fills. Okay, so we have our neutrophils, our eosinophils, and our basophils. Those are the granulocytes. And then our agranulocytes are going to be our lymphocytes and the monocytes. Easy to remember, right, because they have site at the end of their name. Okay, so granulocytes and agranulocytes. Let's start off with our granulocytes and start off with one of my favorite cells, the neutrophils. We call them polymorphonuclear because these cells have what we call a multi-lobed nucleus. And if you look at the picture here, all right, of our neutrophil, you'll see, look at those uh, nuclei inside the cell, all right, all these different lobes that are located throughout. All right, so that's where our term comes from here. All right, so we're going to see these uh, um, cells, all right, these white blood cells, a lot when we're dealing with a chronic, but specifically bacterial infections. Now, when I was in med school, 
you know, the rule of thumb pretty much was if you see an increase in neutrophils, you want to think bacterial infection. And if you see an increase in um, lymphocytes, you think viral infection, All right? That's not, you know, across the board, but usually at first uh, glance, that's what you're thinking here, right? These are the most uh, numerous type of white blood cell. And what they do is they're going to squeeze in these places and, we're, and they're going to go through and gobble up, all right, these infectious pathogens like Pac-Man does with the power pellets in the Pac-Man game. All right, the second type of granulocyte is the eosinophil. An eosinophil, all right, or excuse me, eosin, all right, is referring to a red dye that we use when we're staining, all right, these cells. So they appear to be reddish. We also will see that these cells have a bilobe nucleus, and those lobes will be connected by a thin strand. So if I go back to all right, the eosinophil, zoom in here a little bit, you can see here's one lobe, here's the other lobe, and right in between, it's hard to tell, all right, or you can look here on the, on the drawing here, all right, there's a small thin strand connecting both of those lobes there. All right, so that's for the eosinophils. Now, with eosinophils, all right, if you see those elevated, you need to think, all right, we have some sort of parasitic worm infection going on. And they go around also, and they're going to go and phagocytize, all right, antigen and antibody complexes. Now, we're going to learn about what, this, what an antibody antigen complex is later on, all right, when we get into immune function. All right, but basically, what we'll see is antibodies glomming on to antigens and it kind of makes it recognizable for these cells to go in there and eat them up, right? And we'll also see eosinophils elevated in people that have allergic reactions to things. All right, the last type of granulocyte are the basophils. Again, we're dealing with a bilobe nucleus here, all right? And baso, again, is going to indicate the color of the cell, and this cell is going to have a blue-violet kind of uh, coloration, and that's because all right, we're going to see histamine, and if you don't remember what histamine and heparin are, histamine basically will make things leaky. Your blood vessels will be leaky. Heparin prevents those uh, um, clotting of blood. All right, so with our histamine, right, we'll see that the blood vessels become leaky because it increases the diameter of the blood vessels through vasodilation, so things can leak out. All right, again, we're thinking allergy-like symptoms, and then of course. We don't want the blood to be clotting quite yet, all right, because we might need to get more cells on hand to help deal with whatever the issue is. So the heparin helps to prevent uh, the blood clotting. All right, so that's it for the granulocytes. Now let's look at our A granulocytes, our lymphocytes. These are our T cells, B cells, and then one of the coolest name cells you could have, the natural killer cells. We're gonna see, all right, these cells and a lot of our lymphatic organs, and in case you're wondering what the lymphatic organs are, lymph nodes, spleen, um, bone marrow, any of those related structures there, right? That's where we're going to see a lot of the lymphocytes here, right? And they make up a pretty decent percentage of the population of cells in, uh, out of the white blood cells in, in circulation also here. All right, so the thing that stands out about the lymphocytes is you're going to have the cell, and then the nucleus is gigantic. It's this big, dark structure, and it pretty much looks like it takes up the majority of the cell, All right? So that's one of the things. I'll show you the picture here, okay? If you look, here's a beautiful picture of a lymphocyte. You can see the nucleus there is just taking up the majority of the cell itself. So that is, all right? Our lymphocytes, three types, the T lymphocytes, again, we'll talk about this more when we get into the immune uh, system here, but they are going to help manage the immune response. And then we have our B lymphocytes. Now, they're a very important uh, um, white blood cell because they become our plasma cells. And this is important because you hear a lot about what's going on in current events with COVID. You always hear about antibodies and whatnot. Well, we need a cell to make the antibodies. And these are those cells. The plasma cells are the cells that produce our antibodies and they help us fight, all right, 
different types of infections, viral infections being an example of that. And then of course we have our natural killer cells and they just float around and they check, they're like the quality control. They're always checking out cells and, and, and looking to see, all right, should you be here? If you are here, are you normal or abnormal? So they'll go around and if you are abnormal, you're dead, they're gonna kill you. If you're a cell that's been infected by something, all right, you're dead, they're gonna kill you. So that's what their job is. Like in the name, natural killer cells, that's what they do. They float around and kill things. And then we have one of my all time favorite cells, right, which is the monocytes, okay? These monocytes, all right, are basically a macrophage in circulation. And I'll, I'll clarify that for you, okay? So first of all, right, when we look at these cells, their nucleus has a C-shaped configuration to it. So let's zoom in. All right, this is not the best example in the actual blood smear, but if we look over here, all right, at our drawing, you can see, all right, the monocyte having that C-shaped nucleus configuration there. <clears throat> But basically, when they're in circulation, their job is to circulate, and then they want to get into the tissues. When they get into the tissues, that's when they will turn into da, 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 the macrophages, the Pac-Man uh, white blood cell. All right. So again, when they're in circulation, they're known as monocyte. But when they get into the tissues, and we talked about it in chapter five, when you took 210, about how there's different types of cells we were talking about connective tissue, we had resident cells and then we had wandering cells and macrophages play a role in both of those, but they've got to get there. So we have the type that when they get into the cell, into the tissue, they don't move around and that's a resident macrophage. Right? And then we have the type that when you get into uh, um, uh, uh, the tissue, it can move around in the tissue and that's a wandering macrophage, right? But their job again is to eat things up like Pac-Man. So they're going to phagocytize anything in there, right? Bacteria, viruses, and even debris. And what does that mean, debris? Well, if there's damaged tissue and sometimes there's partially um, existing cells, well, they'll go in there and just gobble up, you know, the damaged portions there while some, another cell group comes in and helps to repair that. All right, so this leads me into um, uh, when we have a blood draw, for example, and your doctor orders a blood draw and they wanna see what's in the blood and they're looking at several different elements. And a lot of times what they'll do is, and you might see in the paperwork, right? They might wanna do what they call a CBC with differential. And the differential refers to the differential count. We wanna see what type of leukocytes, all right, are in that blood sample there, all right? So that's what we're kind of uh, referring to. So if we see, all right, a reduced number of leukocytes, then we call that leukopenia. And that increases your chance of infection, all right? We'll also see if we have an elevated leukocyte count, all right, we call that leukocytosis, all right? And this tells us, hey, maybe there was a recent infection that just happened or possibly, all right, this person is under stress. And I'm not talking about like stress, like, hey, I got homework to do, or and, and I don't have enough time, right? We're talking about uh, physical stress on the body, right? So cortisol levels are increased. There's a lot going on, right? So there's a chance that we will see that leukocytosis, All right? I already talked about the differential count. That's just basically what we're going to be looking at, what type of leukocytes are present, and if any are immature, because that can also tell us if there is some sort of pathology going on. All right, when we're also looking at an increase in our neutrophil count, we call that neutrophilia. Right? And again, if we're thinking increase, it's got to be some sort of infection. Remember what I said, neutrophils will usually be elevated in bacterial infections, but also we'll see it with stress reactions. And then tissue necrosis is when tissue starts to die here. Then there's this term here called left ship differential. That's when we're referring to an increase in our, or not, I shouldn't say an increase, but an actual presence of immature neutrophils. We start to see that. Then we have to uh, be concerned as to, all right, what's causing, all right, this increase in uh, immature neutrophils into circulation? Then if we see a decreased neutrophil count, we call that neutropenia. 
right? And when we're looking at that, we will, um, some of the causes that can cause this, anemia, drug or radiation therapies. And I mentioned that because drug and radiation therapies usually go after what we call actively dividing cells. And so basically that's the whole point. All right, I won't go into the, the whole pathogenesis of cancer, but for right now, think of cancer as out of control, abnormal uh, uh, cell growth. And so these drug and radiation therapies pretty much stop cells that are capable of division from dividing. And so these drug and radiation therapies will target bone marrow. And a lot of our blood formed elements are going to be, all right, in the bone marrow. Our red bone marrow will create that. So a lot of times, all right, if you're taking chemotherapy for radiation, you will see a decrease in the neutrophil count. All right, so what can cause some changes, all right, to some of our other leukocytes, all right, to our monocytes, for example? If we see an increase there, right, we will start for monocytes mainly, you should be thinking chronic inflammatory disorders, okay, because where are most of these cells going to be located? I remember what we said, not necessarily in circulation, but in the tissues there, all right? Also, we'll see it with tuberculosis. Now, decreased monocyte counts, right? A lot of times, um, these people are taking steroids. Prednisone therapy, long-term prednisone therapy, and this is one of the things, steroids are great for reducing inflammation. They're awesome. You know, if I could, you know, have that every time, you know, I wouldn't have to deal with, you know, inflammatory issues for as long. But the problem is that we start to see all right, decreases in our uh, monocytes there. Basophils, all right, increase in basophils. You're going to consider what we call myeloproliferative disorders. Again, that is going to be bone marrow associated issues here. If we have a decrease, right, think of acute allergic and, of course, our stress reactions. Increases in lymphocytes. Remember what I said, lymphocytes, the viral infections, right? But you can't rule out chronic bacterial infections also. Chronic will be usually um, if you have an increase, all right, in your white blood cell count. And if it's short-lived, all right, normally it'll be the neutrophils, right? But in chronic bacterial infections, you eventually might see an increase in the lymphocytes also, right? And that is because this is a long-standing infection and, and we've had to recruit some other lymphocytes to get in there. Uh, we'll also see some leukemias and, some, and our um, blood, what has been referred to as a blood cancer, but multiple myeloma will also um, show us an increase in lymphocytes. All right, decrease in lymphocytes, very famous HIV, folks that have um, HIV infections, and then, of course, there are other types of leukemias which will decrease the lymphocyte counts. And then, of course, sepsis. And like I said before, we were going through the cells before we were talking about the eosinophils. We'll see an increase right, in allergic reactions and in parasitic uh, infections. Right? And then we'll also see increases in eosinophils with some of our autoimmune diseases. So it's a good, it's a good idea to kind of uh, learn what can cause these increases and decreases clinically, especially if you're going to be going into the medical field. And if you think about it, some of it just, it makes sense. All right. But again, you should be familiar with that. Now let's not forget about one of our last remaining uh, form blood elements are the platelets. All right. And so of course we know that the platelets are basically pieces of these megakaryocytes that get broken off. So these structures here, all right, they're not a full cell, they're cell fragments. So of course, they're not gonna have a nuclei. Oh yeah, I can't talk today. They're not gonna have a nucleus, all right? But they play a huge role in blood clotting, huge. So they don't circulate very long because again, they're cell fragments. And so because they're cell fragments, all right, they don't have organelles, they don't have a nucleus, so they don't last long. So platelets will only usually be found in circulation for eight to 10 days. And then they degrade, break down, and then of course your body does what it does very well, and that's recycle things. 
So if we're looking at platelets, we have to talk about this next term here called hemostasis, right? And that's basically, we're talking about heme, so that's gonna be talking about blood, and then stasis is going to be talking about stopping something. So that's what we're referring to. Hemostasis is, all right, you're bleeding, we gotta stop it. And that's that process of stopping the, someone from bleeding. So we're gonna talk about some of the phases here that occurred during hemostasis. Now notice, all right, these phases will overlap. It's not a clear cut thing where, all right, phase one, we're gonna get a, a vasoconstriction and then we can't start phase two until vasoconstriction stops. No, all right, they overlap one another. So that's the first thing that happens, all right, in, in, in a, a situation in which we have, all right, some bleeding occurring. So like the picture here shows you, someone is getting cut by a knife, let's say. And you will see that the blood vessel has suffered some damage, as has the tissue that surrounds it. So what happens initially is we start to see the blood vessel undergo vasoconstriction. Okay, so it causes vasoconstriction to stop blood from leaving the blood vessel. All right, so that's phase one. Then with phase two, we start to get some of the elements in our blood that are designed to stop the bleeding. So the platelets come along and they start to clog up this area where there was tissue damage and they start the clotting uh, procedure. And then phase three, coagulation. And this is where we start to form like our clot and the scab that you're familiar with when you're looking at. So we'll kind of walk you through this because there is a process here with all of this, okay? So let's start off with phase one, the vascular spasm, all right? So we'll see there will be some blood loss, all right? But it helps us to decrease the amount of blood that we lose, all right? And so this can last, all right, for a few minutes, all right, or to much longer than that. But that gives us the time for platelets to get there start to slow the bleed down, all right? And then it allows the endothelial cells, and in case you forgot what endothelial means, that are that is just another name that we give to, all right, the squamous cells or the cells that line your blood vessels. So they will release chemicals into your bloodstream that will say, hey, there is an issue here. Remember we talked about chemotaxis, and so those chemicals will attract, right, cells that will help fix this problem, all right? So platelets and endothelial cells will release those chemicals, all right, that will help to continue on with constriction, but they'll also then send those chemicals out into circulation saying, hey, there's a problem here. We need cells to help out, all right, to begin all right, the repair process, the healing process, and, and check to make sure that there isn't an infection going on, that there aren't any pathogens, all right? So of course, all right, this is a situation in which if there's greater damage, we're gonna get greater vasoconstriction. All right, so let's rewind a little bit. And, and before we kind of go into the other parts of, of hemostasis, I do want to explain to you normally, right? When you are not injured, you ever wonder why the platelets don't just start sticking on to the walls there, all right, of these blood vessels? Well, I'll explain it to you, okay? So when everything's hunky-dory and you're not injured, your um, vessel walls here, the endothelium, are going to release this substance, prostacyclin. If you don't remember what prostacyclin is, all right, it is an acosinoid. That's a locally acting hormone. So when everything's going well, all right, these cells will release prostacyclin. And prostacyclin, think of it like mosquito repellent. It's going to repel the platelets from sticking to the vessel walls. So they might bump into it occasionally, but they won't stick. All right. So they just go on their way. All right, so with this, all right, again, like I said, all right, this prostacyclin, 
all right, to be specific, makes cyclic or CAMP, cyclic AMP. And that is what is going to help repel or inhibit platelets from becoming sticky and clotting in that area there. So now when the blood vessel does become damaged, all right, we're going to form that platelet plug. All right, how does that occur? Well, remember the protein fibers, collagen, okay, they're found all throughout different tissues of the body, all right? So what will happen is, all right, when in our picture there, that knife was cutting into the tissue, all right, and into the blood vessel wall that causes damage to the collagen fibers, and now the collagen fibers are exposed. And we start to release a chemical called von Willembrand factor, right? And that will allow the platelet to stick in the area of injury. And as they stick, more and more will come. You know, it's like people that uh, are driving by an accident, they drive really slow, what do they call them, rubberneckers? And then someone hits them and then someone else hits them. And so they cause another accident. So anyways, we'll get these platelets that aggregate in that area, and eventually that will close off the injury. Problem solved. Now we're not leaking out the blood, okay? And we've also closed off the external environment where all these different possible pathogens are going to be residing, okay? We've closed it off to them, so they can't infiltrate really. And so now we can start cleaning up our mess. All right, so once the platelets have aggregated to the area, right, in the cytosol, right, the platelets are going to degranulate and release their own chemicals. We've heard of serotonin. In the past, we've referred to serotonin as a neurotransmitter, but now we're going to see another function of serotonin, okay? Thromboxane A2 is an acosinoid. So serotonin and thromboxin A2 are now going to continue on with prolonged vascular spasms. Because again, we want vasoconstriction. We want to make sure that we're not losing blood, all right? Then ADP, all right, adenosine diphosphate, not to be confused with ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, ADP and thromboxin A2, all right, are going to now send out, uh, well, these are these, these, chemical, these uh, chemical messengers, which are going to attract more platelets. And this falls under that positive feedback category, okay? So it gets more platelets to come to the area, and then we're releasing ADP and thromboxane A2, all right? And that causes more platelets to come to the area and do the same thing. Now we're mixing in a whole bunch of these platelets there, and we're mixing in other chemicals that are being released, right, which are going to trigger that coagulation there. Again, we're trying to clot the blood, make sure that we're not losing anything. And then eventually, we got to fix everything up. So we'll see the cells that are in that area undergo mitosis. So once where there was one cell, then you'll have two daughter cells. Now there's other cells that will come on hand. I mean, macrophages will flood into the area. They'll come around and they'll start gobbling up damaged debris. And they'll also go around and in case they come across any um, pathogens, they'll go after those. So there is a couple other things that do occur in that area. All right, thrombocytopenia, in case you didn't know what that term meant, low platelet count. So again, it doesn't take long for our uh, platelets to clog up that area, hopefully in about one minute. And we actually do check for that, all right, with a finger prick uh, test to see if you're able to clot in about a minute. Now, if it takes you about five minutes to clot, then we're starting to think that maybe you have a clotting disorder. And so we can further test for that. One of the interesting facts that you might be wondering is, all right, if there's damage in an area and then the surrounding areas are healthy, right? Do the platelets clot or become attracted to those healthy areas? And the reason is no, because 
those cells that are healthy and undamaged are still secreting prostacyclin. So that prevents our platelet clot from getting too big or out of control. It's only going to clot in the areas that there is damage, okay? It's that prostacyclin that's gonna repel those platelets and prevent them, okay, from degranulating and releasing their own chemicals. So here's a beautiful picture, all right, of a platelet clot, the actual blood clotting right here. All right, so you can see, all right, in the bluish green uh, structures there, those fibers, that's fibrin. And think of it like a, a net, all right? We refer to it as a mesh, but we throw our net out there and it will catch things. And that's what happens. And this net, all right, needs to be insoluble. That's an important term here. It is insoluble, which means it cannot be broken down, all right? Because again, we're in a fluid environment and we don't want the solution there to dissolve our solute. So it's insoluble, we form this mesh and it starts to catch more things, more platelets, all right? We'll get some red blood cells caught in there too because they're just in circulation, all right? So that's what we're dealing with with fibrin, which is going to be insoluble, all right? But we have its precursor called fibrinogen. And that's important to know because that fibrinogen is soluble. So that's what is in circulation. Okay, because we can't have something insoluble in circulation because we'll then get random clotting all over the place. We can't have that. So when it's in circulation, fibrinogen is soluble. It won't create the mesh. Then it converts into fibrin. And when it becomes fibrin, that's when it becomes insoluble and it forms our net. And then we can start trapping everything. because We want to slow the blood flow to that area. So here's the last phase there, that coagulation phase where everything starts to get stuck. So a couple things that you need to have for our coagulation phase, all right? Calcium, that helps with our clotting. We won't go through all the different clotting factors. There's several here, all right? But you need the clotting factors and then our platelets and then the fat soluble um, vitamin K here. So think of your clotting factors as enzymes, but they're not activated. They're inactive enzymes here. And so what will happen is during the clotting process, they'll activate, and then they start to enter into an en what we call an enzymatic cascade. All right? And so they'll start to uh, activate and then turn one substrate into a product and then move it to another product and so forth and so on. All right? But these clotting factors are pretty much going to be produced in the liver. That's why folks with chronic liver disease or liver, or excuse me, liver damage, right, have issues with clotting. Vitamin K is important. It's a coenzyme, okay? So that just means it helps out the other enzymes here. When we are trying to convert these clotting factors, when we are making these clotting factors here. So it's important that we have all these players available to us all right, because we are going to transform some of these factors from one factor into another factor so we can have our, our, our clotting cascade occur. All right, and so this picture here kind of shows you, I don't expect you to memorize it, but if you want to appreciate the clotting pathway here, you can see all these different factors that we need to have available to eventually wind up with fibrin. And it's that fibrin that's going to create this net here that's going to clot so we don't have continued blood loss there. All right, so again, I mean, if you want to go through and check this out, but we will see, and you can see here what's also important, that we need calcium along the way here to help convert some of these factors into the next factor that is required in this stepwise process to eventually get us to fibrin to make our mesh here. All right, so keep in mind when we're talking about the coagulation phase one, we're gonna involve the nervous system here, right? We will have a sympathetic response, right? That vascular constriction, that vasoconstriction, right? It's the sympathetic nervous system that is responsible 
all right, for that vasomotor tone there. We learned about that in chapter 15 back in bio 210. All right, so when we get that sympathetic response that's going on with the vasoconstriction, I want you to think what happens when you get a pretty significant wound and now we've lost a certain percentage of blood, about 10%. All right, now the sympathetic nervous system gets kicked in high drive, we get significant vasoconstriction, okay, because you've lost blood, but yet the tissues of your body still demand that blood supply. They don't care that your that your circulatory system has lost it, right? But you have these tissues in your body, like, hey, you know, I need my oxygen, I need my glucose, I need this stuff. You got to get it to me. How can you get it to me uninterrupted? Well, what we'll do is we'll increase your heart rate. And not only that, we're going to increase the amount of force that your heart is going to beat to pump out more blood so we can get that blood, all right, to those tissues. Now, of course, all right, your brain gets top billing, so its blood flow will never be, at least it shouldn't be interrupted, okay? That could be very bad. But also, your heart also, that's important too, because that's the pump for this system here. All right, so this sympathetic response is great until you lose about 40% of the blood. Then it doesn't become effective anymore. And well, you know, you have other problems to worry about in that, in that situation there. All right, folks. Well, that ends um, chapter 18 on blood. I hope you enjoyed the recording and I will see you in our next session. Have a great one.